Is there any tradition as proud on the internet as the creepypasta? Internet scary stories passed around message forums, comment sections, and group chats in the hope of keeping your friends up wondering if they could beat up an acid-scarred 16-year-old in a fight. To say where the exact origins of creepypastas came from would be kind of difficult, because you're basically asking the origins of scary stories in general. There isn't one Edward C. Pasta inventing creepypastas, it's more creator-to-creator -creator basis in terms of their origins. I mean, heck, creepypasta is already a portmanteau of creepy and copypasta, which have been around even longer. Creepypastas are typically a short story told from the perspective of somebody being terrorized by a supernatural force at varying levels of actually being scary. You have a story like Slender Man about a nigh-omniscient cosmic horde that can easily kill you with intimidation, as well as brute force. The Rake, a subhuman abomination who stalks his prey like a feral animal. And Jeff the Killer, a loser teenager in whiteface with a fan base more rapid than African wild dogs! One thing that's consistent about most creepypastas is that they've been written by five-year-olds who got scared by their dog Shadow in the nighttime and are now writing horror stories. But seriously, reread any creepypasta and you'll see the same writing tropes crop up over and over again ad nauseum, to the point that you wonder if a computer is using predictive text to write these with the base being rejected goosebump scripts. But what outdated internet trend would be complete without Sonic being involved? That's right, creepypasta is all about video games where a subculture unto themselves. Spooky stories about everyone's favorite money sink were rampant in the early to late 2000s, when a lot of kids were using the internet for the first time. I think that's what really gave creepypastas their staying power. They came in at just the right time when the premises sounded believable to someone who also believed the Dragonite evolved into Yoshi. It's part of that simple charm of the internet where someone who's on it for the first time wouldn't know who's telling the truth and who's just trying to mess with them. And some would call that child a trauma, but I call it charming. But if the regular creepypastas were badly written, who daddy-o are these things bad? Today on this scary of months, where YouTubers are mandated by the government to make scary content, we're taking a dive into some of the most famous gaming creepypastas of all time, starting with the ones that aged relatively well onto the ones who aged about as well as a mayfly. But just because the creepypasta has a bad reputation doesn't mean that everything that came out of it was bad. In fact, in some examples, they break the stereotypes and end up being a lot more influential than I think people give it credit for. Ben Drown not only set the template for what a lot of creepypastas in the future did, but I also think it's the reason for the ARG craze of today. A quick recap of the story, the main character wants to expand his N64 collection so people stop assuming he's not a real gamer and stop saying his dick's little. He goes to a yard sale and finds somebody selling a copy of Majora's Mask. The immersion is broken then and there because it isn't 60 bucks. In fact, he doesn't pay any money! He gets the game for free from an old feller! However, it isn't all Deku Seeds and Korok droppings, as after glitching the game, the game starts to fight back. Suddenly, scenes were playing out of order, the game was being corrupted, all while he was being watched by the Statue of Emptiness, something that has no way of appearing this early in the game. Then the game became actively hostile after playing the Song of Healing. After realizing that the Happy Lover's quest line isn't worth getting exorcisted over, the author ends up going back to the yard sale to figure out what's going on. It's clear that the game is being haunted by its former owner, Ben. Here's where the story kicks into overdrive. The original author bails and throws the ooky spookiness onto his college roommate, Matt, who reveals in a text document that everything we've seen up until this point has been manipulated by the spirit. Or maybe the author is a nut bar. Slowly, the fact that he might not be all there is becoming more and more apparent, to the point that he's hearing music from the game and seeing the old man who gave him the cartridge in the first place watching him. Then again, at the very end, the bombshell gets dropped that the author never had a roommate! He's been talking to Ben the entire time! At this point, Majora's Mask is barely even a part of the story, as the rabbit hole leads us to a cult's website all about ascending to the Moon Goddess. Except to ascend, you have to off yourself. Further down, the names Alex and Rosa start to pop up frequently, which, and hold on to your pants, folks, relate back to the first two videos on the YouTube channel that uploaded the Ben videos about Prototype and Vampire the Masquerade Bloodline, with the characters named Alex and Rosa! And... I won't lie, I don't really know what this has to do with anything, but I'm darn sure that it isn't here by accident, except I do actually, because by this point, human error was brought into the equation when members of the community started playing along and sending songs to an account to get different results. Like somebody sang a song that allowed Rosa from Vampire the Masquerade Bloodline to talk to people, except some dickweed played the Song of Healing, and as you remember several paragraphs ago, when that happens, bad shit happens! And now Rosa's dead! And- Oh, it was just a game. Yeah, out of story, Alex, the guy behind the story, not the prototype character, admitted that he was an actual college student and this was all getting a bit out of hand financially. Turns out running a cult doesn't happen for free. After the community banded together though, the hunt was back on! Sadly though, following people submitting their phone numbers, which 
Wow, imagine how stolen our identities would be now! And receiving calls of the Song of Healing playing backwards, things kind of broke down. Too much stuff with too little experience meant that the game had to be put on hold for a long time. Regardless of currently being ongoing, this was a fantastic read. A half-assed recollection doesn't do it justice. This game was one of the first purely internet-driven ARGs that caught fire and had people genuinely believing there was a ghost on the internet. That's all without mentioning what made this story so famous in the first place, the gameplay. Actually, decent gameplay for the scenarios described came out alongside the stories, and took it from, oh sure, yeah, of course Link got set on fire, to actually seeing Link get set on fire. Nobody knew what was possible with hacking at that point, especially for a 3D game like Majora's Mask. Honestly, Alex created an incredible spanning narrative that would serve as a template for all creepypastas to follow, and ARGs, like Pet Scop, Catastrophe Crow, all of them have been drowned to thank for laying the groundworks. But it also laid a lot of groundworks for the bad creepypasta tropes that we're going to be talking about. Tropes like a haunted game cartridge, supernatural happenings, and being physically attacked would become commonplace, and most of all, a bar of quality was set. That basically everybody would fail to reach. You're probably asking why a lesser known creepypasta like this one is sharing the same air as Ben Drowned, and that's for one reason. I genuinely thought it was real for the longest time! For those who don't know, in the story of Fallout 3's Capital Wasteland, you can listen to the radio. Somebody has to be maintaining that radio, and our resident spin jockey is Three Dog! No, not Three Dog! Yeah, so to get this working, you have to blast Three Dog away. After he's gone, no one's around to play the music, so what happens now? Well, at certain spots on the map, you can hear Three Dog keep talking where he'll spout off random numbers. When you translate those numbers in associated Morse code, you get a bunch of random phrases. Some talking about a guy's plan for the day, including cleaning his car and getting Chinese, to dates and descriptions that perfectly mirror what and when it happened in the real world, like the BP oil spill and the death of Gary Coleman. The final set of messages are predictions, which have messages predicting the death of Queen Elizabeth and an unexplained catastrophe that causes such a horrible noise that the author ends his own life. We actually do have that sound thanks to some archiving. Begin audio prompt in three, two, one. What a new. So, like I said, this is one of the only creepypastas that got me when I was younger. Purely for the fact that it just sounded like something that would happen in Fallout. Stuff like this was happening in games from around the same time when I had first heard about the number station. Portal 2 made you convert Morse code into spoilers for the end of the game, so I thought this is just where they got the idea. Then there's the dates they chose to predict. The BP oil spill was a very major event to predict, but then there's Gary Coleman's death. It was such a random day to predict with such accuracy that it was impossible for that to just be left up to random chance. The biggest blow to this story, though, was the fact that they predicted the Queen would die on March 19th, 2014. And we're still waiting. Yeah, with that little foible, the story loses a little something, but I still don't think the number station gets enough credit for the fact that instead of trying to tell a story, it presents itself as how you would tell somebody about a video game Easter egg. The numbers didn't predict the date that the author's mailman died, so it doesn't feel forced. Overall, a pretty underrated story. Alright, if I was embarrassed to admit that I didn't know that the number station was fake, uh, I'd rather have taken it to the grave that I didn't know that Lavender Town was a hoax until, like, a year ago. I mentioned it and I thought it was legit and somebody pointed out that it was fake and I was just like... What? I don't know why I thought it was real, I just believed it and nobody corrected me on it because they all thought I was kidding! In retrospect, I should have guessed that Pokemon wouldn't be bigger than most world governments if it had made a fuck ton of kids' initials in a Twitter bio. Well, Lavender Town is really overdone in Pokemon creepypastas anyway. We've got a lot of different graveyards in Pokemon, but people choose to focus on this one graveyard. Then complain the Game Freak about focusing too much on Gen 1! But what we're talking about is only... kinda related to Lavender Town. Pokemon Creepy Black follows a collector who finds a bootleg copy of Pokemon without a subtitle in a black shell. After popping it in, whoops, it's a normal game of Pokemon! until picking a starter. That's when a Pokemon called Ghost gets added to the party. His move spread sucks because you can only use one move, Curse. However, Curse one hit kills anything it hits, and the term kill is very literal in this case, as the Pokemon doesn't fate, it's removed permanently. After beating a trainer, you even have the option to use Curse on them. Aside from that though, 
Uh, no, I was right. It's just Pokemon. You go through eight gyms, the Elite Four, the whole kit and caboodle, mowing down people with your unbeatable instant killer all the live long day. However, after your final battle, the game cuts to black, and now you're in front of a bunch of tombstones as an old man in Lavender Town. Fuck off, Lavender Town! After traveling back to Pallet Town, you go face to face with the same ghost you used for the entire game. All you can do as a frail old man is struggle, which doesn't hurt Ghost, but tires you the f out, to the point Ghost finally puts you down with Curse. What I appreciate about this story is that at no point is this a haunted game. The Ghost doesn't come out and say, ha ha ha, now is the time where I kill you, Jeremy Harrington, age 24, of Appleton, Minnesota. No, it's just a hack version of Pokemon where creepy stuff happens. And that adds to an element of horror where you fear maybe you'll run into the copy of this game by accident at a flea market or a yard sale. Would you even have the guts to pick it up? I could have picked a bunch of different Pokemon creepypastas like Lost Silver, Strangled Red, or Buried Alive, but I think Creepy Black does the most to stay within the bounds of being an actually scary Pokemon story, rather than something that's really, really dumb. <laughs> Polybius is a sort of story that only really works on the internet, one where hearsay and gut feelings trump any amount of actual critical thinking. Cast your minds back to 1981. The arcade scene is positively buzzing! People were lining up for the latest releases. Donkey Kong, Frogger, Miss Pac-Man, motherfucking Gorf! However, for the crowds of Portland, Oregon, even the siren song of Gorf was enough to pry them off their latest vice. A black arcade cabinet named Polybius. The game was... Well, we don't really know what the game was. It was supposed to be a sort of, um... Uh, well, kind of a... The, the game was... There were testimonies of those who had played it, who couldn't recall anything other than a resemblance to Tempest and an insatiable need to keep playing. Now, I've played Tempest, fine enough game, but I'm not breaking an appointment to play it. So what was all the hullabaloo? Well, it turns out there was a darker reason. See, not only were kids crowding around this thing, but so were men in black suits, apparently working for the U.S. government. They were tasked with seeing what effects the game had on people. What effects did they have? Well, anxiety, depression, suicidal tendencies, and even death. After a little while, they collected information from the cabinets and then took them away, never to be seen again. Soon, though, ties to Polybius and the U.S. government were blown wide open, thanks to developers recounting their experience. The game used subliminal messaging to brainwash whoever played it, and it was all tied back to MK Ultra, a project by the US government into mind control. The company that developed Polybius? Cineslosion. There's a new umlau in there, so verdicts are still out on how to pronounce it. Sounds like pretty heavy stuff. So heavy that it falls apart under the weight of its own bullshit! So a video game is offing its player with subliminal messaging. Radical! Was there any coverage of this game pre-1998 on an internet arcade database? This game had shadowy government figures collecting data out of it. With what? I don't know. Maybe a bucket? And not a single whack job thought now was the time to document it with a camera or even just remembering it happened, tell the news? And let's talk about subliminal messages, eh? Do you think something like Frogger could really make you want to kill the president? No, there's literally no way the technology would be capable of doing that given the hardware it was running on. And you may be saying that the government pumped it full of tech steroids to make it mass produce winter soldiers. Well, if that's the case, why are they wasting this tech on arcade games and not anything else? As it stands, Polybius is a good adaptation of the Men in Black horror stories, but it's clearly got more holes in it than a sabotaged condom! For once, we're moving over from hoaxes that totally had me convinced to ones that still get people to this day. Now, sure, those people were and continue to be children, but it's the little victories that matter. Minecraft is a game that I really don't see eye to eye on with a lot of things. For instance, that it's good. But I'll hold off while discussing its most infamous cryptid, Harrow Brian. Keep in mind, when I'm discussing this, I'm purely looking at it through the lens of the original story. If we're taking in the expansive universe that sprouted out of Herobrine, he'd rank 10th on a list of only 9 entries! <laughs> so, Herobrine. The story begins with a user in early Minecraft starting a single-player world and having a gay old time doing... whatever it is people do for fun in Minecraft. However, as he's walking through the fog, he comes face-to-face -face with another player... in a single-player game. The player had the default character model with no identifying name tag, or eyes for that matter. After staring daggers into him, he runs off into the fog and is never seen again. 
What is seen, though, is his work. The player finds two by two tunnels in the sides of cliffs, pyramids of sand in the middle of the water, and trees with all their leaves removed. And in a shocking twist for one of these stories, the author decides to just stop playing. Imagine being an evil demon haunting somebody's game and they just stop playing. That's why Ben was smart. He diversified his portfolio. When attempting to reach out to other members of a Minecraft forum, or as I like to call them, Hell on Earth, his posts were repeatedly deleted by the moderators, with one member named Herobrian contacting him and telling him to stop. However, other members began to contact the author saying they had found similar things. In fact, one popular Minecraft streamer decided to stream his hunt for the creature, and sadly, he found what he was looking for. Eventually, enough was enough, and the community asked Notch who Herobrine was, after it was discovered that the Herobrine from the forums was Swedish, just like Notch. Uh, you know how the Swedes have a sort of, like, ant one mind and can find each other based on scent? Well, it turns out Notch really did have some information, as Herobrine was his brother who died. And ever since, his brother has haunted the game, with Mojang releasing updates saying Herobrine was removed. For any number of reasons, really. He might have said that trans women were women. He might have said that straight Pride Day was stupid. He might have said that anti-Semitism wasn't okay. He was a monster and needed to be stopped! But that's where the original story ends, and honestly, it gets a bit off the rails towards the end with the whole Notch and Herobrine are related, but overall, it's not a bad piece of fiction. It really had everything going for it in regards to Minecraft still being a new and unplunged game with plenty of secrets, fervor around the game being high, and the secret was just believable enough. A secret character watching your every move works in a game as expansive as Minecraft. Would you believe, though, that now is when all the quality gets thrown out of the window? And who better to hearken in a coming drop of quality than the herald of all things terrible, Sonic? And no, not that one. Just wait a little longer. So, Tales Doll is quite the mercy to me, because it's only like three paragraphs long. You genuinely get more content out of a McDonald's menu, and by the time you got to the calorie section, it'd even be scarier. The story is a recounting of somebody coming home with a gift for their son, Sonic R, or as you and I know it, a bad gift. <laughs> nah, Sonic R's fine, really. So he sits down with his son and plays through the whole thing, talking about how Sonic was good before transitioning to 3D. Even his son is embarrassed by this. A few days in, and they manage to beat the final boss and are greeted by the Tales Doll because for some reason you have Metal Sonic, Metal Knuckles, and the Egg Robo, but they decide to get unique with the Tails stand in and make him a weird, possessed doll. Then they go play the game's tag mode, and as soon as they tag Sonic, the game shuts off. They decide to go to bed until 2 a.m. The dad wakes up and hears somebody thumping against a wall outside. When he leaves, he sees the Tails doll there, covered in blood. And that's... it. Well, kind of. It eventually spun off into a Bloody Mary ripoff that needs you to play tag mode and play as the doll and tag Supersonic, which, by the way, have you even played as Supersonic? That's not happening. But if you do now, the Tails doll is going to haunt you and try and kill you. Luckily, nobody owns a Saturn anymore, so the spirit is dead, I guess. Yeah, usually when a creepypasta stinks, it's because they put too much effort into the details. Here, I'm begging for even a scrap! No reason why this is happening, unless you read the extended lore, which reads like an off-Broadway production of a shitty H.P. Lovecraft book. Tails doll as a threat just isn't scary at all. Like, it's a little weird to watch his limbs flail around, but it's certainly nothing I'd be afraid of to run into in a dark alley. But just punt the little squirt for a field goal! Of course, you can't really talk about Tails doll without talking about his older brother, which we will after a quick pit stop in Mario 64. Damn! What I just said. Oh, we've officially entered the best type of creepypasta. The overly verbose, head up their own butt stylings of would be Stephen King's who mistake gore for horror. In Mario 64 Damn! This is the story of a guy and his lady friend who, to prove how basic they are, say that the best video game console is the N64, and the best game for it is Mario 64, and decide to go cop a copy. Luckily, Dumbo and Dumbat know exactly where to get a game and console. Dumbo's uncle's Game Shack. When they get there, they find the console and the game and are about to buy it when the uncle warns them that the game and console have been returned 15 times together with the people saying that it was of the devil and made in hell. But this warning falls on the deaf ears of our squishy leads as they buy the Satan Square anyway. When they do, they attempt to start the game three times with the game screaming like a banshee each and every time. If this were a game of baseball, this N64 would be out, but Dumbo and Dumbbed aren't so easily thrown off. 
After getting the game to work, they get warped to Big Boo's Haunt, the lavender town of Mario Creepypastas. Except this was a scary, spooky version of Boo's Haunt, with blood everywhere! And when they try to enter, they see Mario, but he's hung from a noose! They decide that, yeah, the devil's probably gotten into modding and is messing up Mario 64, and they decide to return it in the morning. They go to sleep, but Dumbo just can't help himself. He sneaks downstairs and tries to play it again. But when he does, Peach and Toad are dead, and a black figure is torturing Mario. Are you scared yet? Please say yes! And once he ascends the final staircase, who does he find hanging at the top but himself? Yes, he's able to recognize his own face with the fidelity available in the N64! And then he passes out, with the same black figure from the game standing over him. I... I guess he helped him up and helped him rehydrate because he was able to write out this whole story. What a guy! Uh, this story is the first one without any wiggle room. This is awful, awful writing. There's no atmosphere or tension to the whole thing. It's just describing gruesome images, with the one thing ruining it is that it's all happening to Mario. The image of Mario hanging from a noose, it's not as scary as you think. Nobody in this story acts like a human being, least of all the uncle who after seeing people return the game with a console 15 times doesn't just throw it away. Mario 64 Damn! is one of the best examples for how bad this medium can be. But however bad Mario is, you can expect Sonic to be there being 10 times worse. Uh, hi! What do you want? What are you doing? Why are you twerking? Perhaps the most famous creepypasta of all time, Sonic EXE has exactly as many fans as it does haters. Like I said, the wider scope of the story's sins aren't exactly being factored in, but if they were, Sonic EXE would be quarantined to its own video. However, the less time I spend on Mr. X's wild ride, the better, so let's get down to business. Sonic EXE starts off with the author Tom, who in the first sentence asserts that everybody likes Sonic. This establishes him as an unreliable narrator. He gets a CD from his friend which just says Sonic EXE on it. It comes with a note asking him to smash it with a knife or something, and don't play it under any circumstances. Unfortunately, the note was upside down and he reads it as PLAY IT RIGHT NOW, Kelly BOY! He starts off and the classic Sonic the Hedgehog starts screenplays. But for a brief second, Sonic has a bunch of nasty gunk all over him. I'm sure it's fine, the disc is probably just rusty or something. He's taken to the file select screen from Sonic 3. Highly odd, but there's probably just, like, a lot of rust. First save file is Tails, and when Tom clicks it, all seems well in Tomtopia, until he starts running and sees dead animals all along the track, and at the end is the blue blur himself. But when he tries to get his attention, it cuts to Tails running away as Sonic chases him with scary black eyes, and then Sonic kills him. And then, if you can believe it, the exact same thing happens two more times with Knuckles trying to throw hands with the evil Sonic and Robotnik running away in a blatant ripoff of the Sonic EXE tail scene. After they're all dead, it cuts to the funniest picture ever made. Some of you may think it's this, or this, or even this. No, this is the single funniest picture ever made. After he ceases, he turns around to see a bloody Sonic plush on his bed. Breaking my own rules for a tad, by the start of the next Sonic EXE story... DON'T WORRY, THERE ARE SEQUELS! What happens to the sexual Tyrannosaurus Tom? Did he A. Punt the stupid doll off his bed and break the disc like his friend asked? B. Moved out of the house and broke the disc like his friend asked? Or C. Play tonsil hockey with the 12 gauge? Vote on your phones now! Sonic EXE is the poster child for every lame, overused trope, not just in creepypastas, but in horror in general. The game is haunted by what it never says, just a, a mean, nasty Sonic who decided to take revenge on all those people saying he had a rough transition to 3D. The main character is a drooling moron who, after being told by his friend to smash the game into a million pieces, then burn it, decides that the thrill of the gamer is just too alluring and plays it, and continues to play it after seeing what a bad idea it is. And it coined the greatest three words in all of storytelling. Say with me, baby, hyper-realistic blood. It's so stupid and cheesy that I'd love to say it's parody, but as the creator has somehow communicated, despite the fact that his head has a permanent residency up his own butthole, this is deathly serious. It's also the worst video game creepypasta ever. Or rather, second worst. See, there's one creepypasta that I find even worse than Sonic EXE. And if you're familiar with creepypastas, it's probably one that you like, and I genuinely don't understand the appeal of it, because it's like every creepypasta trope put together, done awfully, mixed with its own terrible writing problems, 
And for such a monster-sized disaster, it's gonna take a monster of monsters. You ever just hear an opinion that, like, everybody has, but to you it sounds like crazy talk? Like, even outside of fandom or whatever, trying to put yourself in a different headspace, it just still doesn't make sense. That's me and this stupid story! Godzilla NES has a few positives. For instance, the fact that it goes for a less popular game means it's untread territory, and it's got really good pixel art to go along with it! People who are 10 times more talented than me have pointed out the fact that these pixel measurements are all out of whack for the NES. But as you're about to learn, that's a story feature. The story follows Zack, an avid Godzilla fan who feels nostalgic for his classic childhood Godzilla game and gets a copy from his friend. All is normal except for the bosses who start to glitch out. They were different sizes. Some were even from films that weren't even out by the time of the game's release. Zack decides to brush this all off as his friend having a copy of the game from the super future. Or that he just has a homebrewed copy. However, it soon becomes too much to pass off as a mere coincidence, as he comes face to pixely face with the terror of this game. Red. And all he can do is run. Listen, I know this technically isn't the story itself, but you can't say Red is scary after this visual. Look at his idiot stupid legs scuttling like a crab to try to catch the famously fast character Godzilla! It's pathetic! After this point, the story disappears into so much self-important melodrama. This story is equal parts concerned with talking about a scary video gem and getting over what a cool dude Zack is. This is a character who burns Red with one of his sick gamer quips so badly, he feels the need to turn to him and show him how much his feelings were hurt. That's before we learn that Zack had a dead girlfriend who was hit by a car because she had a brain defect that made her stand still, and that brain defect was Red! And now Red is in Godzilla for NES. And this happened, like, ten years ago, so Red must have just been really, really bored. And then, in a display of pure gamer skill, His words, not mine. He manages to take down Red! But only after his ex-dead girlfriend comes in and gives him a new character to fight with, because apparently the afterlife has a programming course! Now that his girlfriend's tortured soul can finally rest, it's time for Zack to decide what to do with the game that tormented him so. Does he destroy it and rid the world of Red forever? But this was the vessel for his girlfriend! But if he lets it survive, so does Red! Zack has proven himself to be nothing less than a good judge. So not only does he let the game survive, he also decides to hawk it on some poor sap by selling it on eBay! eBay has a policy against selling possessed artifacts, so that's a delisting, a good job, Now, why do I think this is worse than Sonic EXE? Well, look at it like this. Sonic EXE is the length of a single web page and didn't get cringy and mainstream till YouTubers got their hands on it. Godzilla NES is not only extremely lame from the outset, but is eight chapters long with an epilogue! Those eight chapters are filled with Zack acting like a moron after the game starts interacting with him, making lame Godzilla fan exclusive jokes, and while fighting for his life, knowing that the game is catering to him as a Godzilla fan. You're fighting for your life against the parademon that killed your girlfriend and scarred your life. Uh, hey, wait, is that the music from Super Godzilla? Oh, Fred, you sweetheart. Speaking of the big red son of a gun, what is Red exactly? He's the tumor that killed Zack's girlfriend, but he's also a demon in the game, and he can also cause real harm because he hurt Zack in the real world. Oh, but Zack is such a tough guy that he can get set on fire and still play video games! What makes it so bad is that it completely believes its own hype, and that it's delivering this epic tale of love, torture, and vengeance, when, need I remind you, the game looks like this. Maybe there are no good creepypastas. 